All right, we are uh, now looking at the incarnation. Uh, it's not Christmas time, so you're going to have to gird up the loins of your mind and focus on uh, what has been called God's most difficult work, uh, the incarnation. And I want to begin by, and this is an impossible question for you to answer, really, if you think about it, uh, and the type of things that drive me nuts when professors know the answer to a question that they've conceived in their mind, and everyone sits there, and they don't know what to say. But what are the most shocking words in Scripture? Now, I'm going to give you the answer. I don't want you to think too hard, but it's... It's a question nonetheless. What are the most shocking words in Scripture? And uh, I think they are found, at least a good case can be made for the words found in John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, those first five words, and the Word became flesh. Uh, we're talking about Yahweh. We're talking about God. In the context of the first century, God who is altogether different from man, God who is exalted in the heavens, a man who is finite, who worships God, and yet John has the audacity to say to Jewish believers who he is writing to, Yahweh, the Word, God, became flesh. Uh, it's really uh, mind-boggling, and there's no uh, doubt that it is the miracle of all miracles. It is uh, God's greatest wonder. No creature could have possibly have imagined such a miracle. And as one of my favorite Puritans said, his name is Thomas Goodwin, heaven and earth kissed one another, namely God and man. Uh, and it really is the uh, great confession of the church. Great indeed we confess in 1 Timothy 3 is the mystery of godliness. And what is the confession that all Christians are to confess? He was manifested in the flesh. Uh, that is our confession, the incarnation. Now, I just want us to, uh, again, turn on our uh, sanctified imagination and think now of the heavenly court. And Adam has sinned. And the angels are tasked with finding a way whereby God can save Adam and his descendants from their sins. And the angels are tasked with coming back to God after they have deliberated among themselves a plan of salvation. Now remember, the angels see God in His holiness, His righteousness, his goodness, His love. And so, whatever plan they come back with has to do justice to the fact that God is who they see Him to be. So, of course, they could go away and say, well, God could just merely decide to forgive Adam. But then they would be impugning His holiness and His righteousness and His justice for God to just simply wipe the slate clean. They would, as one theologian said, they would have returned after a billion years with a bill of ignoramus. Uh, because, think about it, imagine the angels going back and even conceiving this idea to the triune God, the Father will send the Son the Son will take on human flesh. 
He will be scorned, ridiculed, rejected by mankind. He will become a worm and not a man. And he will, who has for all eternity known the smiles of the Father, cry out upon a cursed tree, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Imagine the angels even daring to think such a plan of salvation. They would have trembled to have even thought such a thing. You see, we know that the Christian religion is true and the plan of salvation is really true because no one but God could have ever concocted such a way to save sinners. Who would ever have the effrontery to say that the Son should die under the wrath and crushing blows of His Father? So the glory of the Incarnation is the fact that we have two natures, human and divine, in one person. Eternity and temporality, eternal blessedness and temporal sorrow, omnipotence and weakness, omniscience and ignorance, unchangeableness and mutability, infinity and finitude in one person. Stephen Charnock says, what a wonder that two natures infinitely distant should be more intimately united than anything in the world. That the same person, and here I think Charnock has probably the best way of words of any Puritan, even better than Thomas Watson, that the same person should have both a glory and a grief, an infinite joy in the deity and an inexpressible sorrow in the humanity that a God upon a throne should be an infant in a cradle, the thundering Creator be a weeping babe and suffering man. The incarnation astonishes men upon earth and angels in heaven. Now, we hold to the truth of the incarnation because as Christians we believe that the incarnation makes communion with God possible. Otherwise, it would be impossible. It would be impossible to relate to God apart from a mediator, apart from the God-man, Jesus Christ. And I want us to look at contrasting some of His divine attributes with some of His human attributes to see the glory of the incarnation. Sometimes we, uh, pardon the pun, flesh it out in ways that don't do justice to what the incarnation actually meant. So, for example, Jesus is the eternal God. That means He has no beginning, no ending. He always is what He is and always has been and always will be. He is perfect before all ages. He is God. He inhabits in one moment, billions upon billions of years before His naked eye. He is outside of time. He possesses this attribute of eternity. He's the ancient of days. But then, we could go to Psalm 90, for example. Psalm 90 is one of those psalms where God is contrasted with man, and yet when you read it through the eyes of the incarnation, you find that in Psalm 90, verse 2, God is spoken of from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's true of Jesus Christ. He is from everlasting to everlasting. But then, look at verse 9. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. Verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Verse 17. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Now, why do I bring up these verses? Because by becoming man, these verses became true of Jesus Christ Himself. The Eternal One had to number His days. He knew that He would not have a hundred years on earth. He knew that after he was ordained at age 30, he would have roughly three years to do God's work. He had to number his days. His years came to an end with a sigh under God's wrath. You see, the eternal one is also the temporal one 
who had to go through day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute. He knew hunger for 40 days, and it scorched him in his very being so that angels had to minister to him. The eternal one, in need of nothing, becomes a temporal being. The immutable God, which means that God does not change. He is not a man that he should change. He is infinitely blessed. He doesn't know sadness. He is perfect. He always will be. He is the eternal, unchangeable God. And yet, because of the incarnation, we read that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature, that He changed, that He had to learn to walk, that He grew in wisdom and in knowledge, that He learned obedience through His sufferings, that He was a man of sorrows, that He knew what it was to be a child and grow into a man, the unchangeable God in Jesus Christ is also the changeable man, knowing all of the difficulties of what it is to live in a condition where He would change, where He could be happy one minute and grieving the next minute, which is not true of God in His being, but true of Jesus Christ because He became like us. Or the omnipresent God, which means that God has no bounds or limitation, that if there were 10 million worlds, He would be in every world perfectly, that He is as perfectly present here as He is anywhere in the universe right now. Think about that. God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit are as perfectly present here right now as they are anywhere in the universe. And yet, Jesus left His Father and came to earth. And we sing that song, and can it be He left His Father's throne above, so free, so infinite His grace, that as a true human being He could say that one day He will go to His Father, that He left His Father, that in one respect He is present everywhere, and yet in another respect He was on earth yearning to be back in heaven with His Father. The incarnation should astonish us. The omniscient God, Jesus is omniscient. We are told that God is great, abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure in Psalm 147. That Jesus, according to His divine nature, knows all things, past, present, and future. That He knows the number of hairs on your head. And if there were 10 billion worlds, He would know every fact there is to know about every world perfectly. But then we're told in Isaiah 50 that the servant Jesus Christ was awakened morning by morning to be taught by His Father, that He increased in wisdom, that He speaks of the teaching He received from His Father, that as a young man He read God's Word and had to appropriate God's Word and learn God's Word and memorize God's Word, that He became man, which meant that He had the ability to learn and grow and ask questions that it didn't come easy for him. Because while it's true that he was fully God, he was also fully man and capable of learning. The omnipotent God, that God's power has no limit. When we speak of God, it is impossible to say that there is anything such as hard work for God. Again, if God creates 10 billion worlds or a grain of sand, it requires roughly the same amount of work for God because He is infinitely powerful. There's no such thing as hard work. And we know that God speaks of His work in uh, different types of ways. There is what uh, theologians distinguish between God's absolute power and His ordained power. So God's absolute power is that God can do anything in accordance with His nature, such as we read, do you not think that I can appeal to my Father and He will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Or do you not think that God could turn these stones into children of Abraham? 
God has absolute power. God could have us all hover in the air right now without chairs because He's God. But we also know that God has what we call His ordained power, which is not strictly the same thing as His absolute power. His ordained power would be something like this. Jesus says, do you not think I can appeal to my Father and He will send 12 legions of angels? But then what does He say? But how then would the Scriptures be fulfilled? Or, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. The Father could have beamed Jesus up to heaven in the Garden of Gethsemane and relieved Him of all of His sufferings because He's powerful. And Jesus Himself, according to His divine power, could have done that. But then what does He say? Not what I will, but what you will. In fact, God's power is displayed in Christ's weakness. For He was crucified in shame. The incarnation, the all-powerful Son of God, becomes weak. Has to be ministered to. Sweats like drops of blood. Cries out in agony because of the pain, both physical and spiritual and emotional. In fact, he's the majestic God. We're told that God is clothed with splendor and majesty. And yet Jesus is scorned by mankind. That people spit upon him, struck him with their fists and mocked him. That he was placed upon a tree. In the same person you have divine majesty and human indignity and suffering and shame. So Jonathan Edwards can say in his famous sermon, The Excellency of Christ, there meets in the person of Christ such really diverse excellencies, which otherwise would have been thought utterly incompatible in the same person, such as are in no other person whatever, and such as neither men nor angels would have ever imagined could have met together in the same person had it not been seen in the person of Jesus Christ. You have the most shocking, disparate attributes of glory and shame in the same person, of someone having to ask, who touched me? Or the day of my return, only the Father knows, and yet in His divine nature, He knows all things infallibly. The incarnation is a glorious, glorious mystery, and no one could have ever made up such a truth. Now, I want us to just look in terms of some application, the effects of the incarnation. The first point is this, that the incarnation of the Son of God means that Jesus is forever both God and man. Now, There was a time when I thought, okay, this is obvious, but the longer I teach, the more places I go, the more I'm shocked to find time and time again that people are unsure about whether Jesus is still fully a human being. Now, let me assure you, He is still fully human as well as fully God. He will forever be fully God and fully man in one person. He became flesh. And it is as important for your salvation that He is still human now than when He was human on earth. Because He sympathizes with you in heaven as a merciful high priest who must be truly human. Otherwise, how can He sympathize with you if He does not have those experiences to remember of what He went through on earth? He is human now because if He were not, you would be a miserable, miserable Christian. Why is that? Well, we're going to look at that in a little bit later. But I also want you to notice how much God loves flesh. I was in Brazil once speaking on heaven, and the translator was a little bit... uh, unsuccessful in getting across my point, and the people were most uh, offended because I said, heaven is going to be a fleshly place, Uh, and you can take fleshly in a sense that is immoral and wicked, 
Or you can take fleshly in the sense that I'm speaking of matter, human bodies and, and, and a new earth and trees and rivers and lakes and mountains and fruit and, and all the rest. And so what I mean by this is that God is willing forever in Jesus Christ to be identified for all eternity with human nature. That's how much He loves human flesh. This, this human flesh that we possess, God loves so much that He will identify with us forever by way of the incarnation. Now, what does that mean? It means that uh, we are going to be like Jesus. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, it's one of my favorite verses, we know that when we see Him, we shall be like Him. Why? Why are we going to be like Him? Because we shall see Him as He is. In other words, the reason you're going to be like Jesus Christ is because you're going to see Jesus Christ. And when the eyes of faith see Jesus Christ, those eyes will turn to sight and you will be transformed into His image. And if He were not a human being, then what image would you be transformed into? So His humanity is the reason why your humanity will become like His humanity. You will share in His glory. Maybe I can put this uh, another way. You're going to look a lot better one day. <laughs> and you see, as Christians, this is, this is quite a liberating thing for us. Because if you look at the way in which the world currently functions, billions upon billions upon billions of dollars are spent on anti-aging this. People not wanting to get older. People resisting what is just a fact of human nature. We are outwardly wasting away, whether we like it or not. Now, just so that I'm not completely misunderstood, I believe that we should all, within reason, do our best to look nice. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I, I would like to say, if I had the guts to a few Christian ladies, that perhaps they could dress a little better, and a few Christian men, that they could brush their teeth and comb their hair and... and try to look at least a bit appropriate for public consumption. Uh, I'm quite serious. We're, we're, you know, we value the body. We value what God has made. And within reason, we aim to glorify God with all that He's given us. But in another respect, we know the pressure is off because we can't fight against the effects of sin. We will one day die. The incarnation gives us hope that whatever is true in these bodies, whatever uh, deficiencies we may have physically or emotionally or whatever makes us up as human beings are going to be ultimately dealt with one day and we will be glorified in a way that we can't even conceive right now. And that is our eternal destiny. So for Christians, as I say, the pressure is off. For those who are not Christians, you can see why they do everything in their power and in their bank account to resist what is ultimately a losing battle. I mean, how silly is it to see articles of women, look at how great they look at 60 still. Okay, so you got an extra 10 years of looking great. You're still going to turn 70, and then you're going to get to 80, and believe me, it's not much hope after that. <laughs> when was the last time we saw an 80-year-old on the cover of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue? <laughs> now, I, I, I say this not to be highly offensive, but to illustrate a point that we have to take serious notice of what the incarnation means for us. It means that God really does have in store for us something much better. And we either believe that or we don't. And the incarnation also explains why heaven will be forever. Now, for heaven to end, 
one of two things would need to happen. The first is this. Uh, Jesus would have to pass out of existence. So you can think about the likelihood of that. Because if Jesus passes out of existence, then we could also pass out of existence. Or God would have to sin. Why is that? Well, for this very simple reason. Jesus is the bridegroom. We are the bride. And heaven is the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the union that exists on earth between Christ and His bride will be presented visibly in the new heavens and the new earth. And that union is a marital bond. It is a marriage union. Now, what does God say about divorce? I hate divorce. Jesus would have to divorce us for us to not be with Him forever. So heaven will be forever because God, who hates divorce, will ensure that our marriage with Jesus Christ is an eternal marriage that will never end. God would have to sin in that way or Jesus would have to pass out of existence. Both are impossible. That's why heaven will be forever. Not just because God says so, but because there's compelling theological reasons why you will live forever and ever and ever because of the incarnation. There will never be a time in heaven where you are not able to glory in the incarnation because you will always see the visible Son of God. And then finally, we are explicitly commanded to imitate the incarnation. Remember in Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves. And then Paul speaks gloriously about the incarnation. After the words, Christ our Redeemer, Benjamin Warfield says, the words, Christ our example, are most precious to Christians. We are to imitate Christ's humility. Paul says so in Philippians 2.5. And what does that look like? Well, I just want to close with this poem from Augustine. And if I may just put a brief puff for Augustine. I know all of the words that Augustine uses in this poem, but how he was able to put them all together defies my brain to figure out. Uh, There are certain thinkers, when you read them, you just wonder uh, how they were able to do what they were able to do. Augustine's one such person. There's not many. So I'm, I'm building this up considerably, but just listen to this. Man's maker was made man that he, ruler of the stars, might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread might hunger, the fountain thirst, the light sleep, the way be tired on its journey, that the truth might be accused of false witness, the teacher be beaten with whips, the foundation be suspended on wood, that strength might grow weak, that the healer might be wounded, that life might die. That's uh, the glory of the incarnation, and that's great indeed we confess the mystery of godliness that He was manifested in the flesh. Well, uh, be happy to take uh, some time now for any questions or questions.